talk from Dr. Jacopo Anis from the Brain Observatory, a neuroimaging lab in Brain Bank. Dr. Anis? Hi, just let me share my screen quickly. Can you see and hear? Okay. You're great. All right, perfect. Thank you. So yeah, the topic of my talk is uh, brain bank, and I I tailored our um, kind of the presentation of our work uh, on the uh, the concept of precision medicine. So one thing I wanted to to put this in context first is uh, talk a little bit about the connectome. I don't know if any of anybody is familiar with the connectome project. Is, um, it was an NIH-funded project to map the connectional architecture of uh, uh, several thousand individuals. Now, the connectome was very influential in the field, in my field, in neuroscience, because it made, uh, it made the concept of individuality mainstream uh, before the concept of uh, singularity in, in brain science was really um, something that anatomists like me would have and not the brain mapping community at large. So we are in the era of the connectome. Now we look at the human brain, uh, not as the brain, as a template, uh, but we look at it as many, many different brains. And this, of course, has consequences in the development of, uh, I think, positive consequences in drug development for neurological disease, uh, and of course, including uh, drugs against uh, brain cancer. Uh, now, there is a, I apologize for the gross image, um, but um, th there is a mismatch at the moment between uh, what, how brain banks operate and these new emerging views of the brain and neuroscience in general. Because brain banks really operate still uh, trying to serve, uh, I would call them uh, research, researcher centric. So they're trying to accommodate researchers needs and their goal is really not to understand the entire, uh, holistically, the entire um, condition of the patient themselves. So it's not something really to help the patient, of course, in the long term, uh, but it's really centered on what researchers need. So uh, it, it quite irreverently, I, I refer to this as a kind of a meatpacking approach because brains are harvested and, and divided into several small pieces and that are shipped to different labs. Now, the problem with this is that a lot of the tissue is wasted um, because there are usually areas in the brain that are more studies and others are not. Uh, it is very difficult to, to aggregate the results of studies because uh, once publications are, uh, are out, it's very difficult to determine which specimens were actually used for this studies and whether there is some redundancy, whether three or four publications actually used the same tissue coming from the same individual. Uh, limited scope because only few samples are typically, the samples are small, so you get a very, very small field of view. And like I mentioned at the beginning, researcher centric. So uh, we're not really, uh, brain banks are not really geared up to, uh, to really understand what is happening in the patient and that particular patient. And, as I'm, and this is a, in contrast with the new uh, idea of the patient and their brains as being you know, the center of our efforts. Now, our brain bank actually originated uh, from the study of one particular brain, uh, a very famous brain in the neuroscience. And he was a, a young man in the 50s who had epilepsy. And uh, at that time, uh, surgeons knew that the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe uh, had something to do uh, with, the, with the, the seizures was potentially the, the origin of the seizures in the brain. And so the surgeons uh, suggested this experimental approach, which involved uh, removing, ablating, essentially the medial temporal lobes in their entirety in both hemispheres. Uh, the, the procedure was carried out in 1953, and it actually did re resolve uh, most of the seizures, but it also left uh, uh, patient HM unable to make new memories. And that was the first time that uh, science understood that memory and is actually uh, relies on a particular structure in the brain, namely the hippocampus. So we were charged with the um, responsibility of understanding uh, what was happening, what had actually had happened in 1953, and uh, understand the topography of the lesion, because there had been thousands of papers written about these patients, 
and he really inaugurated uh, decades of memory research. Now, for this very famous and important brain, uh, we wanted to make sure that we could uh, have a new way of analyzing it and a new way of doing pathology. Uh, we wanted, first of all, to make sure that the data was compatible with the Connecton project so that people could actually map this data to other neuroimaging projects. And so this slide here shows our protocol, which really meant that we first ran a cadaveric scan to have a, a view, a three-dimensional MRI scan of the brain, the way it sits in the skull, not to disturb the geometry of the, of the brain. And then once the brain was removed and fixed, and hard, then we also run a high resolution scan of the brain itself, after which the brain as a whole underwent histological processing and analysis. So these are the images that uh, thus we get with these different types of MRIs. Uh, now I'm talking about, uh, at, in this particular context, I'm only talking about post-mortem work. Uh, bear in mind that uh, all the patients that are enrolled in the brain bank at the moment also have been imaged while they were alive. So this is sort of a combination of a longitudinal project of a longitudinal imaging effort in life to track the uh, either the aging of the brain or the, the, the disease progress. But the moment the patient dies, then we stepped into sort of the post-mortem work, which involves, as I mentioned, further scanning so that these images you see on the top of this matrix are actually fully compatible with images that were acquired when the patient was alive. And then when we do uh, the ex vivo scan, these are images that can be very high resolution and allows us to look at mark MRI markers in much more detail, because now the brain can be imaged for over 12 hours in the scanner. What's important about this is that now we can combine everything that we're going to do subsequently, essentially all the work that we're going to do to understand the micros, the, what, what are the underlying uh, pathologic markers of the disease or of aging, uh, to the type of analysis that are done of the brains of uh, thousands and thousands of individuals that are imaged in vivo. You may recognize maybe some of you recognize as sort of the output of this free surfer pipeline, which is a semi-automated pipeline to uh, an analyze the brain structures quantitatively. So it, it gives you volume uh, out you know, different structures and surface reconstructions. So you can combine essentially all the markers that you acquire in vivo with the markers that we're gonna examine post-mortem. After which uh, the brain now is, has to be processed histologically. So one of the things that we wanted uh, to make sure of was that the brain would remain as a whole specimen so that we could study these markers in the context of the entire brain. And we could also make statistical connections between different parts of the brain. And which entails, again, processing the brain as a whole. And here you see it, uh, the brain embedded in a cast of gelatin uh, and frozen in uh, isopentane. Uh, after which the brain is sectioned into giant histological slices. You see here the image of, uh, of what, what you see at the top as you, as you take layer after layer. Typically a human brain uh, that is sectioned in the coronal plane at 70 microns would yield between 2,500 and uh, uh, 3,000 slices, depending on the shape of the brain. Um, and uh, this is a quick video. I was discouraged in playing videos because they might come out chopping, but I'm gonna show you a little bit the procedure. And this is essentially what, what is done at the lab. These brains are, are sectioned in this manner. Now, the, the interesting aspect of this process is that while we do the sectioning, we also image the block face with a, with a camera, with a digital camera. So at the end of the procedure, you can actually rebuild a, a monolithic model, an unabridged anatomical model of the brain post-mortem, which is essentially uh, like an MRI, but in this case, it's sort of physical uh, tomography. So we're actually looking at the real tissue and real tissue contrast. The beauty about this is that we can now, uh, for every voxel in this volume, we can align it to the original MRI, but also for every voxel in this volume, which is approximately 40 microns cube, we can then uh, link a score, a neuropathology, 
or a specific marker that will be analyzed microscopically. And these sections that we were removing from the block as we were slicing, of course, are stained histologically because we need to look at the cellular detail. I'm showing here a very simple uh, nistle stain, but of course, this technique can be applied to a, a very vast array of neuropathological uh, stainings. Uh, to look at Alzheimer plaques, to look at uh, fiber architecture. So we use this protocol in that particular example. Uh, we then use this, this whole pipeline to, to really map the lesion in patient HM and, and uh, at different levels of resolution. And inequivocably, we were able to ascertain that some of the hippocampus actually remained and other lesions that were previously unaccounted. So it is, a, it is a very powerful method when you want to study the brain microscopically, essentially anywhere in the brain. And I think for glioblastoma work, this is particularly important. Uh, now, bear in mind, uh, one of the, uh, the title of the talk also talked about being image centered. So uh, this brain bank is really a digital brain bank because uh, we not only distribute tissue in the form of those slices that were being cut, but we also distribute images through a dedicated website. So all the data that is acquired during the process is then actually available to be studied by other laboratories. The goal is really to, to be kind of a virtual laboratory because and do most of the work and then distribute the data rather than classical brain banks, which distribute blocks of tissue. Uh, now, what, are, what can be uh, the context of today's symposium, what can be the future uh, preclinical applications of these protocols. Now, we applied this to the study of HIV. Uh, now, this work is, is very useful when you want to bridge uh, MRI and pathology. So when you want to validate the observations and the analysis made on MRIs, when you want to look at what's lying underneath MRI markers of a disease, and in our case, we use this to look at white matter lesions in HIV, uh, understanding whether it was an inflammation or whether there was actually axonal damage. So you see here uh, abnormal white matter, and you can see in these different, uh, uh, different slides what the normal white matter looks like on the right and the abnormal white matter in these regions of hyperintensity. So we could see that it was not simply a matter of fluid in the tissue, but it was actually loss of axons. And as I mentioned before, we can map this type of histological data precisely on each voxel of the MRI. Uh, when it comes to studying tumors, what is very important is to understand the borders of the tumor. So these borders are very shifty and they're not uh, as precise as sometimes segmentations done on the MRI would, uh, would indicate. So it's very important to really look how these borders behave. And I think that, again, this type of brain banking, it lends itself very well to this type of, uh, of validation. And remember, this is post-mortem work. So really we're learning from patients who were not so lucky, but who wield their brains to research so that other patients in the future could benefit from what is, is uh, discovered in their brains. Uh, another potential use of this, given that uh, the data contained in the brain bank is compatible with the Connectome project, is also to understand the dynamics of how this tumor moves about, uh, following perhaps uh, major fiber tracks, so just like Alzheimer has been uh, suggested that the distribution and the evolution of Alzheimer pathology in the brain may be related to the individual connectomics of that particular patient. So likewise, understanding in that particular uh, person uh, their connectome at the, at the MRI, so therefore at the low resolution level, but also the microscopic level, can help also predict in future patients how the, the tumor is going to behave, how it's going to evade the rest of the brain. Uh, finally, now typically and classically, brain banks were always faced with a dilemma, uh, which I write fixed or fresh frozen. Um, it, because you know, typically brain banks would have a brain and would cut one hemisphere, one hemisphere would be fixed in formalin, 
paraformaldehyde, the other one with fresh frozen. And, and this is because formalin fixed tissue allows you to have very good morphology and very good anatomical mapping, but uh, fixatives like formaldehyde and paraformaldehyde tend to uh, uh, jeopardize uh, genomic work. Now, the good news is that these days there are a lot of technical developments that allow actually to do genomic research on formalin fixed and even paraffin embedded tissue. But we're focusing on paraformaldehyde fixed because I think that this is a sweet spot that maintains the ecology of the tissue intact, but also gives you very good morphology. So you know exactly what type of cell you're, you're looking at and what type of fiber tracks you're, 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 you're essentially navigating. Uh, uh, what does this mean? This means that if you can do genomic research and proteomic research on formally fixed tissue, now you have potentially decades of research of patients across different years that can also be compared. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Kazari made me aware some time ago of a new tech, of a kind of very new development in this field, which actually allows to do a very uh, large scale and broad genotyping uh, on formalin fixed tissue. And this is from nanostring technology. So, you know, I think this is really the future. I think brain banks uh, can evolve now from simply providing tissue to researchers to providing a lot more data and a lot of image. But most importantly, if we maintain the identity and the, in, in a holistic way, uh, the understanding what was happening in that particular individual patient, then I think this would this biographical data would be very important also to interpret the the genomic or the anatomical or the radiological data. So what we do, we interview our patients and we we we, we acquire a lot of admittedly anecdotal biographical information in addition to the medical history. But we think that it's very important to actually understand what the patient experience was in relation to the course of the therapy and record that as just as we record everything else as a very important uh, part of the, as we say, the topic of this uh, symposium as a patient-centric approach. So to summarize, uh, here's kind of a, the brain bank of the future, uh, image center, whole brain, centralized data archive, and web-based data sharing. It is patient-centered because we're really trying to maintain the, uh, the, the, the identity and maintain the focus on the patient themselves, even if admittedly for this kind of studies, these patients are now deceased. And it's, if you allow me a little digression, it's also a way to honor the patients who contribute to research in a more meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anise. That was fabulous. Thank you. Hope it wasn't too long. <laughs> no, no, it was excellent. There's so much information. It, it, I don't know how you got it all into that time frame I as it was. Back. Yes. If, if there are any questions, go ahead. So I don't see um, at the moment. I think that we have a few questions that may be posed to you after the event. Okay. Um, they may be posing them to you privately. Uh, we have had some interest in that as well. So please be prepared for those questions to come to 